Hello everyone, welcome to the latest edition of The Front Page and it should be a belter because loads of great stories to discuss from the last week in the racing world, on the race course and off the race course and joining me to discuss them are two of my highest profile colleagues, our senior reporter first of all, Chris Cook and Chris, you brave the London traffic to get in today. Yeah, set off about 5am. Oh, when from get... Cheltenham? Yeah, well I mean it's the least I can do to be here with you Lee. Um, comes to something when you get stuck in traffic before 7 a.m. So I was grinding my teeth for the last hour. But anyway, here we are. Well, Chris, it is lovely to have you with us. And Peter Scargill at his home. How far from Newmarket are you, Pete? Oh, barely a stain through, Lee. And you have been out on the gallops for two hours so far this morning already? Oh, yeah. If that's the, if that's the image we want to portray, then I'm very keen to get behind that one. Yeah. I, 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 I don't doubt it for a second. And um, on the show this week, I will start, first of all, uh, with a confession, I am a fool. Uh, for last Saturday, I backed Aplutard at four to one to win the Cheltenham Gold Cup. I'd done the same 12 months earlier. On that occasion, I wasn't a fool, albeit I did it after the Betfair chase. This time, I am a fool. But is Aplutard deserving of having been dismissed by some bookmakers for the Cheltenham Gold Cup? We'll be talking about that. We'll also be making another big anti-post verdict on this occasion on a story that's vital to the future of British racing. We'll be asking the question, will the BHA now be able to run the sport with, uh, more, um, with more power, with, with more effectiveness uh, following the changes to the government's, the governance structure of the sport over here? Uh, and finally, as well, a warning, both Chris Cook and Peter Scargill will be walking out of this show prematurely, leaving me to finish it on my own. That's our way of showing you what it was like at Ascot on Saturday <laughs> when mass defections robbed three big races of three very big stars and left Ascot with its first walkover in 39 years. What lessons can be learned about that? Well, our first story this week comes after a very, very interesting day at Ascot, which sadly wasn't as interesting as some of those who paid good money to watch the racing had anticipated. Peter Scargill, Ascot, please talk. Uh, it was one of, it was that, wasn't it, Lee? You just couldn't bear to watch what was going on. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'm slightly conflicted because I don't really think there was anyone to blame or that anyone could have done it more about it. So we had the situation where we were going to see Constitution Hill, we were going to see Edward Stone, we were going to see L'Ompresse, we were going to have small but you know, competitive races um, at Ascot, which is a great track for jump racing, uh, and it just disintegrated in front of our eyes. I mean, you were there, Lee. Um, it must have been every two minutes someone was coming up to you saying there's another non-runner. Um, the image was not great at all, was it? Um, people who paid to go down there, people who were looking forward to these horses, horses we were all building up the week towards alongside our Plutard. Um, but again, I just I don't think it's anybody's fault. And I think a lot of people have got their got themselves very revved up about the perceived reasons for people doing it. It's it's a it's a tricky one. Um it's certainly not a it wasn't the weekend it should have been anyway, or the day it should have been. No, and, and Pete, you were speaking to to Ed Chamberlain um for a piece that ran on the front page today and he, he was talking about it as a missed opportunity for the sport. Absolutely, and I think that's the, the feeling we all come away with, really. Um, there was no uh, Premier League and Championship football. Um, the World Cup in Qatar didn't start until the following day. Uh, it was on the main channel. You had four of the biggest names in the in the sport, arguably the two best in Aplutard and Constitution Hill. Um, all the big guns were there. Um, it was there front and centre, and we could have had a day with uh, great headlines, um, people talking about the horses, people getting excited about the season ahead. That's not even talking about the dreaded C word in March. Um, and we kind of fell flat on our face, but that wasn't, it wasn't because we kind of messed up. It was just the circumstances dictated that, but, but the, the anger and the comments and the frustration that it's, that it's generated, I don't know, it's taken me back a little bit. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I, I agree, Pete. Um, and I understand why, Chris, and I've been, you know, one of those who's lamented some of the the fields that we get in, in winter graded races and the, the lack of competition we often get. And therefore I almost felt on Saturday I should be getting involved in this in this steamroller of criticism. But I actually think on this occasion, as Pete says, you do have genuine excuses. And I think it's about the ground as much as anything else. Lord Pressey had done a leg already. 
Um, so I could see why they didn't want to run the horse. And Alan King had already pulled Edward Sun out because of the ground at Cheltenham the previous week. I think once Alan King had said what he'd said about um, his Friday runner having come back jarred up, there was very little chance that Nick Henderson was going to run Constitution Hill. But he did go out onto the track. He did walk the course. And he, he was showing me his stick and how far the stick had gone in on his gallops that morning mm. and how much less further it had gone into the track at Ascot on Saturday. And although quite rightly people are saying everyone has to be careful about the language that they use in relation to the ground, and there's no, there's no way we can say that good ground is a welfare issue in jump racing, I think the point is that a lot of people thought the ground wasn't good at Ascot on Saturday. Marcus Armitage, our press room colleague, who knows more about the ground than I do, certainly. Heck, he's won a Grand National. He walked the course and he said it was... He won a Grand National on very quick ground. On firm ground, right yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. Uh, he said it, it, it was it was quick ground. And to be fair, yeah. Chris Stickles, the clerk of the course, didn't dispute the fact that this wasn't ground for easy horses. And I sort of think that a as big a story here is, is what happens with the ground in these situations because you can say this was a freak summer last with last one was quite wet but if we are going to get more summers like this this is going to become more of a problem because what you found at Ascot on Saturday what Newbury are finding this week I spoke to Andrew Cooper yesterday he said Sandown was just the same you're getting lots of rain on race courses at the moment in in, in quite tight periods but then within a day it's gone through it's just so good because uh, because of that that dry summer. In a normal year, you'd find that autumn good ground is quicker than spring good ground because you, you, the water table is is low and you haven't got that base of moisture in the yeah. ground. But particularly so at the moment. And what happens going forward? Because it seems to me that good to soft is the new good in terms of what a lot of trainers think is acceptable for their horses, in the same way that you can argue that good is the new good to firm on the flat. I, I, I think the ground is as big an issue here as those defections in themselves. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's basically the whole story. I've come round to that way of thinking. I mean, it's, it's just interesting to me that, you know, Chris Stickles at Ascot, as you say, he's not arguing with the trainers. No. He's not saying, you know, well, we've provided perfectly good ground. Anyone should be able to run on this. He, he's accepting that there is an issue there linked to the uh, sort of freak summer that we had. Well, we, we hope it's a freak. The land is just parched. And uh, Keith Otterson down the road at Newbury is saying something very similar. You know, he had a ton of rain last week. Mm. And, it, you know, that's just disappeared into the ground in a way that we'd never expect in the middle of November. So we, we have to recalibrate our thinking and we have to hope that, you know, next year and the year after aren't going to be exactly the same as the, the kind of summer that we had this year. That I appreciate there's going to be people out there who love a long, hot summer and so they'll think that we're a bit miserable talking about how it's nice to get occasional rain. Uh, there's only so much you can do, I think, because, uh, again, people are saying, well, if you look at the Ascot Jumps track, you know, during the summer, you know, about Shergar Cup time, say. It's brown. It, it, yeah, exactly. And it was it's, brown. It's obviously thing. not being watered. You know, they're putting hospitality on top of it. Um, and so maybe they should be doing more through the summer to, you know, just watering it from time to time just to prevent that from happening. But you know, I think when the weather is as it's been this year, you know, it's going to cost you an absolute ton of water. To, um, to keep that under control, to keep it raceable through the, you know, that whole period. I think fighting nature in that way is just not really a realistic option, particularly when we've already, we've been talking for years about um, you know, the environmental impact yep. of the way we look after our race courses and, and is it a responsible use of water to keep chucking on tracks in the way that we do now. Um, I, I think it, you know, if we're gonna make any kind of adjustment I can imagine a time where we maybe have to push some of the core jumps races back in the calendar just because we're not getting the kind of good to soft, soft ground that you, we traditionally would get around this time of year. Um, in, and it's, that's what the racing calendar has really always been based around, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That expectation you're going to get ground that big, heavy jumps horses can, can race on now. That being said, it might be a specific problem to Ascot. I mean, that, you know, that we know since the home straight has been relayed, that place does drain particularly well. We had a really interesting and compelling card at Exeter on Sunday there. It, it wouldn't have had the quality that Ascot yeah. would have had. Um, but there were plenty of runners there. I think it was average 10 runners per race. There are other good jumps cards going on just now. Um, so uh, Twitter is like the worst place to be when you get a story like this because people overreact to such a degree. You get a pile. And, and they ride their hobby horses, don't they? I, you know, 
you don't have to go far if you're looking for somebody who's saying this is the end for jump racing. In fact, I've had people text me that over the weekend, you know, bless them. Um, I don't feel that it's that. Uh, I do feel that jump racing has some kind of existing vulnerabilities that are not being addressed, which taken together with what happened to Ascot created really a, a bad situation. Um, yeah. And I, I, I hope that we're looking after those race scores. I haven't read anything about you know any money back that they got. I don't suppose they did get any. I, th I think in the future when something like that happens, we really ought to be um, doing something to make sure those people don't feel let down or, or, or cheated in any way or, you know, um, because the reality is a lot of those race scores have left their home to travel there on the Saturday morning expecting to see four horses that won at the last Cheltenham Festival and by the time they get to the track there's only one left and that's Cool Cody. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, they're not getting when they arrive what they paid their ticket for. I think that's a really interesting point, Pete. I was, I was doing um, sort of a few Vox Pops around Ascot on Saturday and actually a lot of race cars were very understanding. I did speak to one race car who said he, he, he wanted to boo the race course having produced that sort of ground again I, I don't think he was appreciating the, the the weird weather that we had last week but if i go and book a ticket for a a west end play and i'm booking it because there are two big stars in those two leading roles and on the day uh, those two stars come out uh, and understudies are in there now i don't think i'd probably be able to get a a, a refund although i'd feel quite quite miffed potentially. What, what, what's your take on it? If you're a race goer and you have gone to Ascot on Saturday, that the minimum ticket price on Saturday morning was, was 25 quid and you've gone to see those stars, not to see a two run, a grade two race and a walkover, should the race goers be thinking about offering something to those race goers in a form of compensation? Yeah, but particularly in this situation where the day was built so much around these particular horses, um, I think that you know it's a goodwill gesture on that front, and, and we all know that uh, attendances aren't the most robust, um, and you know racing's got a battle for for attention at the moment. It's you half wonder whether some of the frustration around what happened on Saturday was to do with the general view that people might have now that everything's about Cheltenham. So when when a, a trainer or connections do make a decision because they don't like the ground, for example, with with Constitution Hill and they, from, from an outside perspective, you were there. Nicky Henderson seemed to go out of his way to um, they explain to everyone why he didn't want to run his horse. Yeah. But then everyone's going, oh, well, this, this is just because it's, you know, if it was Cheltenham, it would be different. And it's, you know, Cheltenham blows everything out of the water. And it's almost like piling on people's pre-existing um, prejudices against the sport. That's, that's, I wonder whether that's where a lot of the anger comes from. Um, and, yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult for those people who were at the races to swallow um, going there paying 25 quid plus all of their um, you know, petrol or train ticket or whatever it is to, to see nothing happen you'd, you'd think that there would be something for for those people to, to make up for it really you know even if, even if they don't have to it should be something that, that race courses consider yes I think you are very probably right oh disappointment uh, for one set of customers on Saturday but fortunately I do have big news for customers who like to use the Racing Post app because I can say to you now you should be downloading our new app it has exclusive content for the biggest names including Chris Cook and Peter Scargill free daily tips from our star tipping lineup loads of great content and well worth accessing that is the new racing post app time now to move on to our second story this week and it is my story and this time it's about the governance of british racing about which there was uh, big news last week it is it was news that we were expecting we'd already heard about um, plans to change the governance structure in british racing and they were revealed last week out were the members and executive committees of the BHA. The members committee particularly important here because that was in the past the key strategic decision making body for British racing and its problem and in many ways the problem across British racing's governance as a whole was the power of veto. You had race courses with three votes on one side, you had participants with three votes on another and finding agreement between those was extremely difficult. In theory, the BHA chair had a casting vote, but if a casting vote uses that vote uh, in those circumstances, in effect, you can alienate one half 
of the entire sport. So we have a new structure now. The BHA board will undoubtedly now be the overall decision-making body for British racing. I'm going to say debate about whether it was or it was or it wasn't in the past, but it definitely will be now. Underneath that uh, BHA board will be three new committees, uh, an integrity committee, an industry liaison committee, and crucially, a commercial committee uh, that will look at things like the racing product. They will be heavily dominated by stakeholders, race courses, and participants, but they will only advise the BHA board and the BHA and the stakeholders are insisting that it will be the BHA board that ultimately now will make decisions about British racing's future. The board, just to uh, remind people, does have stakeholders on it, two from the race courses, two from the participants, but it's also got the BHA chair and chief exec plus independent directors as well. This has been sold, Peter Scargill, as um, the great saviour of British racing and the decision-making process and that the sport should have a brighter future as a result of it. What do you think? What do I think? What do you think? Racing? What do I think of racing saying it's got a bright new future and everyone's going to work together? Um, well, I think it's a lovely idea. <laughs> yes. um, I think it's good that something's actually got done. I mean, Chris um, sat in that studio um, back sort of September time, um, frustrated at this this two-day meeting with the, uh, at the time, anonymous guest list. Um, the strategy taken, meeting. The strategy meeting, that's yeah. the one, with, with things seemingly not, not going anywhere at any speed. So, look, they've achieved something, something's ha happened, and they've stripped away this um, power of veto, which basically led to no one ever making any decisions because or putting anything radical forward, even, um, as our industry editor, Bill Barber, has written about, um, because they have like, what's the point of putting anything radical forward? It's going to get vetoed anyway. Um, it seems a sensible way to work, um, but as ever, um, we'd, have, we'd have to see when these decisions get made. I mean, people are talking a good game, saying, oh, you know, there'll be short-term pain. Uh, we all know it's for the greater good. We can plan for long-term strategy now. I, 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 <laughs> I want it to work. I'd like to see it work, and I hope it does lead to an industry strategy, um, but we'd have to see um, whether the tough decisions have just been pushed down a layer to these um, um, committees rather than um, sort of exploding at the top. That would be my view on it. Yeah, it's down. well, it sounds like a reasoned view. Um, Chris, um, I thought it was interesting that the BHA have, have tried to make absolutely clear that the, the committees, and I suppose Chris is commercial mm. committee, which will have such a wide remit, won't be able to block things from going to the BHA board. But I did think it was interesting that in the BHA's press release, they spoke about um, the BHA board act acting on behalf of its members, in effect. And at the press conference last week, the Racecourse Association's representatives, again, were stressing that the BHA, in effect, is a sum of its parts. The BHA is owned by stakeholders. It's got four shareholders, the Racecourse Association, the Racecourse Owners Association, the Thoroughbred Breeders Association, and licensed personnel making up trainers, jockeys, and racing staff. And I, I got, the, I, I in, inferred from what was said there that if the BHA board doesn't act in the way that we think it should be acting, we retain the right to explode this new system and start with something new in the future. Am I being overly pessimistic in that analysis? No, definitely not, because it's still horse racing that we're talking about. I mean, it's a very valuable point to make in case anybody imagines that we're somehow gravitating towards a, a world which other sports inhabit, where you have like basically one person who's a kind of benign dictator pointing the way and saying, this is where we're going, chaps. Um, it's been one of the sort of problems um, up to now that the BHA has sort of felt constrained. You know, you have to govern on behalf of everybody and we can't get on the same page and, and you know, people are vetoing suggestions. Um, hopefully we're now a bit closer to a, a world in which, you know, somebody can put forward a, a suggestion, you know, um, a possibility and, and try and build a consensus around that and actually make progress towards that idea. But uh, it's, it's still the case that you have basically lots of different competing factions whose interests are not the same. Mm. Um, and you have uh, legally problematic issues like ownership of fixtures that's never been tested in court. And it would be fantastically expensive to test it in court to see who actually does own the fixtures. Yeah. 
Um, you know, it would be really helpful to have a final ruling on that subject. I don't know if we're ever going to get there. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's a really, basically what we're looking at is in order to make any progress, we're looking at a really difficult, tricky uh, taxing work of diplomacy. Um, and th th there are some people involved at the top of the BHA who would give you hope that, you know, perhaps yep. they might be able to achieve something in this area. That, that's going to take time and it's going to inevitably look like a fudge, whatever we end up with. Um, but, you know, per perhaps that's what racing has basically decided that it wants. You know, it, it doesn't want to be dragged in one particular direction that's going to cause significant pain for any one of its sectors. In particular, I think, the, you know, the race courses talk about, you know, well, we almost take our share of the pain. But I think when it gets to the stage of outlining a particular sum of pain that, that you, race course A, is going to have to absorb, you know, that's the the time when we'll find out whether people are actually prepared to swallow any of this or if they just buck and kick and prevent anything from happening. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, it's a case for two cheers, I think. You know, th this was necessary work. It gives us hope, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anything is going to be different in the future. I think, I think Chris's point there is uh, key, Pete, in the sense that both sides, the, the, the participants and the race courses, have said last week that they acknowledge that this new system whereby the BHA board has the, 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 the decision-making powers, the ultimate decision-making powers, will result in either one of those sides, should be both on those sides occasions, um, getting bad news and not getting what they want. Now, in the past, when they've not got what they want, they've had that, that power of veto and they've been able to stop things progressing. They won't have that now. I suppose key is, how will they react if that happens, or if it keeps happening, what, what, what's, what's your take? Yeah, I suppose it's whether it keeps happening would be the thing, wouldn't it? I mean, then one would probably want to look very noble, potentially, in taking their, their share of the pain to begin with. You know, we're doing this for the best of the sport, we understand. But, I mean, if you take what happened at the weekend, for example, with the small fields, we're not discounting what we discussed with the ground and what have you, but... I mean, you talked in your column about uh, quality jumps review and, and changing races and people have talked about removing fixtures and what have you. So we've had what's happened at the weekend. Would we have the situation where race courses and, and professionals, for want of a better term, can come together and say, we'll, we'll see that that's not good for racing, that's not working, it's not the best use of the horse population, it's not the best use of um, ITV, we're not getting the money we should do, let's get to a resolution now have we have we got to a position where we can do that or is everyone still going to sort of talk a bit they might give a little bit and every little tiny victory is going to have to be made even bigger because at least we've worked together to get somewhere um you'd hope that the change can be significant rather than than small when you would hope that that people are forced to to compromise and forced to work together a bit more in the situation because they don't have this fallback um, and it's also sort of worth mentioning that, that I mean, some people have wondered whether there should have been some scope for other parties to be involved. Yeah, um, the likes of bookmakers and what have you on a on a commercial front. I don't know whether that's a slight missed opportunity. I'm not sure what I feel about that, but um, I, I, I think, think I think in general there is scope there for it to work. You just want it to work. Uh -huh. I, th I think as long as we're trying to build a consensus and make everybody feel involved, it was a mistake. It's just a mistake to not involve punters and bookmakers yeah. um, in an upfront way instead of saying, well, we'll, we'll consult with you when we, we feel like it. Yeah, we'll see how this beds in and then make a decision. Um, but the, the other thing I, I feel like saying at this point is, you know, I remember when the tripartite system was created, it wasn't that many years eight, ago. Eight, seven, eight years ago. Um, yeah. And there were some, you know, highly respected commentators who've been around the game for a very long time who... Um, praised that whole deal and said it was going to be the, the right thing for horse racing. It was really going to help us going forward. Um, I don't blame that for getting it. I don't blame them for getting it wrong. But, um, you know, I think that's just something to bear in mind when we're analysing this change to a new system. You know, um, y you shouldn't be getting too excited about something like this because it is still horse racing at the end of it. And we've got decades and decades of evidence to show that the sport is really hard to govern. Would you also, I, I would also have a, uh, a concern as well that um, given it's all about the BHA board now and say ultimately um, that means that on regulation decisions you will still have to an extent the regulated involved in regulation albeit not with a 
with a with a majority vote in the in the in the BHA board, but they're still involved in that process. And part mm. of me thinks that, in terms of regulation, the regulator shouldn't have any part of the decision making process. Yeah, I mean, well, that's a five-hour conversation. Um, we, we've never had uh, a, a regulatory authority that's sort of structurally independent from the entire sport. Um, and people who um, are participants, for example, or, or you know, owners uh, who sort of just see themselves as, as funding the whole thing, um, they, they want to say in what the rules are going to be. Um, you know, we're talking about the whip rules again mm. just now, aren't we? And you know, everybody has to be consulted. Everyone has to have their say on that. Um, you know, I, I just don't think that this is a, a bunch of people who are ready to be um, governed from afar by people that they can't even reach. Um, so it was, it's, it's an interesting idea, but I, you know, it's, it's a long way down the, the road, even if anybody wants to lead us in that direction. But I think overall, I think we're, we're, we would all be in agreement that what we got last week does feel like, like progress. It does seem like a, a welcome development, but the proof of the pudding will be in the eating and there should be some pretty hot and spicy meals coming up for British Racing and the BHA board in coming months. We move then on to our final story. We're back on, on the race course and on this occasion we're back where I would have been going last week had Constitution Hill not been set to run at Ascot on Saturday, which is Haydock, the Betfair chase. Chris, I say I had this misery of backing that Plutard in the morning at 4-1, to one, think he'd be 2-1 to one after the race, he's now 12-1, to one. I'm an idiot. What about Apple Tart? I mean, could still win, obviously. He could still win. The, unfortunately, I backed him with the bookmaker that is now the biggest price about Apple Tart, which mm. means my cash out option is the most miserly. So I don't know what to do. Should, should I should I should I stick or should I? Well, you've got to let it ride now. Yeah, you, I think you, I do. you can't cash out three days later for no. for a, an, an instant loss. Um, yeah, poor Apple Tart. I, I I still find it slightly baffling. I must say. I mean, and, and that for me is is nearly the, the most interesting part of this race with respect to connections of Protectorate, who put who up could a career, be the Gold Cup winner, put up a career best, um, and you know they were all, all delighted. That was a really important moment for. You know, people like Dan Skelton winning the Betfair chase for yeah. the first time. Um, and uh, and those owners had a big day. They also have mm. Hitman, Jed Mason, Alex Ferguson. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, Aplutar, the last time we saw him, he was a really impressive winner of the Cheltenham Gold Cup. If you judge it on Racing Post ratings, it's like historically one of the best Gold Cup winning performances there's been. Yeah, I mean, the final it, fence the line, he was extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, although I think that was exaggerated to some extent by the fact that Manel Endo just stopped and nothing, okay. uh, who was in second place. But I mean, fundamentally, as I say, but if you go by RPR, he's one pound behind Cotter Starr's um, second Gold Cup win, which yeah. is the better of the two. Um, so an extraordinary performance in March, and then he comes out um, in the middle of November and fails to complete the course for the first time. I mean, that's actually the first time that Aplutar hasn't run in the first three in his entire yeah. career. Um, and I, yeah, I feel kind of bad about it myself because I wrote a big long thing to fill up page two of sat Saturday's <laughs> paper about you know how he was, he, there was just no case for going against him. And it makes uh, sense to me. Yeah, protector drifts to fifteen to two and, and wins like a good one. Look at one of the reasons why I backed him. Um, I, so I, I've, I thought about it a lot, and I mean, there's, uh, watching the race, there's really. There's almost no time where you're thinking, this is great, this is definitely going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you felt the same way. Yeah, I, 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 watching it from Ascot, I thought, particularly on that second circuit, mm. I didn't think Rachel Blackmore ever looked really happy on the horse. I didn't think he was jumping particularly well no, that, that He wasn't was, making mistakes, but he wasn't whizzing over his fences. That was the giveaway for me too. Like, especially if you watch last year's race, the difference is, is marked. Mm. You know, because he's sort of soaring over those fences and yeah. it looks like, you know, he's not having to put it all in and, and he looks in control and comfortable and happy. Um, whereas uh, this time, um, you know, he's sort of brushing through the top. He was putting in extra strides even on the first circuit on occasion and jumping out to the right. Um, and you, so although, although sort of Rachel's kind of sitting there sort of icily still, you know, in that sort of Jamie Spencer-esque sort of way that she has sometimes, mm. um, it, it was fairly clear from like a mile out that, that she might not be sitting on a great deal. And, and so he pulls up, doesn't he, after the first fence in the home straight. Um, going into the fence, you know, she was giving him slaps down the neck and really encouraging him forward. And he took an extra stride and went through the top and slowed down very quickly. Um, which was something that she mentioned in her post-race comments, mm. you know, how, how easy it was, was to pull him up yeah. when she made that yeah. decision, which is, yeah. so it's all very discouraging. I think probably when you're looking for culprits, 
uh, number one is the ground, and there, there might not even be a number two. I mean, he has, as people have pointed out, he's run big races on soft, even heavy ground in the past. But those were at distances short of this. So you're talking about two mile, two and a half mile races when he was a different kind of horse before he sort of grew into the stayer that we now know. Um, and he's a very strong stayer at three miles, but this was easily the worst ground that he's tackled since he's been stepped up to that sort of distance. So I think you've basically got a heady combination of small horse, up and trip, bad ground, um, and he's just, he's not had a fun time jumping out of that, and, and he, you know, he's run out of puff. You could also talk about, and, and this is speculation, because um, Henry de Bromhead hasn't said anything about this, but it might be the case, I was thinking this through, that when he came over for the Betfair Chase last year, it's the first time that he's, he's tackling that race, it's his first time that he's starting off his season in Britain rather than at home, um, and it might be that they had him proper ready for that race last year, whereas this year, they know it's a race he can win because he hacked up last year. They might have just give, kept a little bit back for themselves, knowing there's a long season ahead. They might not have worked him quite so hard in the build-up to this year's race, you know, thinking, we've got a bit in hand here, realistically. Um, and so maybe that's part of it as well. That you know, he, he, It's possible he hasn't done quite as much as he had done by this stage last year. I mean, that, again, that's just something that was in my mind, speculating about how it would be if I was training a horse, what I would be thinking. Um, I don't suppose we'll ever get sort of confirmation one way or another on, on that. Uh, Henry has said that the horse seems to be fine. He can't work out what might have gone wrong. There's nothing, you know, evident in the horse's health. Um, so you would think there's every chance he'll, he'll go to Leopardstown next month, get better ground in a race that he's run well in in the past and put up a big performance. I certainly hope so because, you know, he's a, he's a star horse. He's still pretty young. We want him to come back, but uh, yeah. you look at that race on Saturday, you think that might take a bit of getting over. Pete, um, you, you've been brought up with horses. I was not brought up with horses, but I did read someone once say that horses are not machines, <laughs> which means that you can forgive them one bad run. How concerned would you be if you were in the Aplutard fan club right now? And what would your diagnosis of that performance at Haydock be? I wouldn't be particularly concerned uh, unless I was you, Lee, with my not particularly good anti post bear. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I mean, my old man obviously trains horses and he's talked about horses having um, sort of viruses or even sub viral issues. So, like things that are so small they can't even really be picked up. And when a horse is put under pressure, like they are in races more than they ever are at home, um, that can, that can um, trigger that and the horses can, can stop like Aplutar did at the weekend. It could be something as simple as that. Um, you know, it's been a milder, a milder autumn, and, and little bugs and stuff go around, and it, it wouldn't necessarily show up in a scope, or you know, always wouldn't come back with anything obviously wrong with him. Um, Henry de Bromhead and the team know him inside out. Uh, I'm sure that he will be in fine condition next time. But it's almost you forgive this one, like you say, all, all things go wrong with horses. We put our expectations onto them, not the other way around. Um, so. If he goes and performs next time in the saddle chase, it'll be fine and there's, there's nothing to worry about sort of thing. Um, if he goes and produces another poor performance, um, then all of a sudden you're saying, well, why is this happening? Is there something underlying? Did he, did he explode at Cheltenham? And as a result, um, he sort of, that was his big performance. And, and, you know, it's sometimes difficult for horses to get back up to that level again when they go to the race course. I mean, that's, again, speculation at this stage. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it suddenly it kind of opens up the Gold Cup market in a way, doesn't it? The Cheltenham Gold Cup market because um, there's been a reaction that the Gallop and the Champ is now even shorter um, for the Gold Cup, and then sort of Aplutards out with these other horses like Long Presse and and um, and others. So I, I don't know. It, it, it sort of it should make for a more interesting few months ahead. I think if it had just bolted up, um, it you know, whilst it would have been good for you, Lee, um, it yeah. might not have given us such a, a good narrative to use that word. Before you just go on to Protector, not good for anyone who backed Galopin de Champ for the King George last week when his odds collapsed from 8-1 to one to 9-4. to four. Yeah. And then we hear Willie Mullins on Sunday say he hasn't really got any intention of running the horse in the race. No, and Brave Man's game's like 11-10-5. to 10, five. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a very tricky business following the money, isn't it, yeah. in anti-post betting. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think... In jump races, anti-post betting works well at sort of the five to seven to eight days out from the race when you have a fairly clear idea of who actually is going for the damn thing. What about Protectorate for the Gold Cup? 
Yeah, well, you've got to take him seriously. Um, I, I would tend to think if you're going to have a bet now on that market, probably Aplutar would be the way to go because people overreact, don't they, to one race. And so Protectorate's shortened and Aplutar has gone out. To, I mean, 12s with one firm, yeah. 9s, 10s with others. Yeah. Um, I remember about this time last year saying Manila Endo is a good bet for the Gold Cup at about 10 to 1. And that, you know, I still think that... That Even wasn't a bad way rice. to go, but uh, yeah. it didn't work out. Um, I didn't get paid. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think probably I'll be keeping my powder dry as far as the Gold Cup market is concerned. I don't feel as bullish as you about taking four to one four months in advance about anything, really. Um, but it's interesting, you know, that, that there's, I don't think there's one standout performer in that. You know, we're, we're going to have a good Gold Cup again, hopefully, if, if all these horses stay fit. Thank you. My bullish days are now way behind me after Saturday. I do, though, have to now make a, a decision about what this week's uh, winning front page story should be. Uh, Pete, I was at Ascot on Saturday. I was wrapped up in that story. I was absorbed in that story. And as a storytelling journalist, I was delighted to be at Ascot, not Haydock in, in many ways. And I think particularly the ground thing and whether this is a long-term issue now both in terms of what ground conditions will be and what conditions trainers are happy to run top horses on I think that makes it a big story um Chris Aplutal is the Cheltenham Gold Cup winner can't don't get, get much bigger than can't get don't a bigger get much story bigger than that no. uh Chris you spoke about the Gold Cup winner Apl right you don't get much bigger can't than the get can't a bigger get star in bigger. the game. You can't get a bigger star or a, or, a, or a bigger story. So I win, right? Except that, well, and I, I hate doing this when I'm in, in, in this chair, particularly to, to, to Chris, because he, he takes defeat very badly. <laughs> um, but I do think, as we're talking about um, the future governance of British horse racing, which is crucial to how the sport will look in the coming years, I have to make that the the winning front page story of the week. I and I apologise to Pete it. and I apologise to Chris, who's had to cope with the congestion charge Do you, do you know the, the, the industry story never wins, except the one time when you've got it and suddenly it's the biggest story around. How about that? Well, we, we could, we, I, I could let you win and you could have my four to one Aplutar vouch. How about that? Oh, there no. you go, you see, his reaction <laughs> says it all. Um, before we end this programme, I have more news, and that is that we have a Black Friday Racing Post Members Club offer stay ahead of the field. £10 a month for your first three months of membership. Use a link in the video that you're watching now. Subscribe today, say £10 for three months, and you get some amazing content in there. You get great tipping content, you get great features content, great analysis content. As I say, you get my front page guests from this week, Chris Cook, you get Pete Scargill, you get myself, Lee Mossad, you get lots more people. It is well worth uh, taking uh, the advantage of that offer. And I hope also you'll rejoin us when we have another front page next week. Until then, thanks to Chris, thanks to Pete, thanks to you. Bye-bye.